Hey, can um, hey there, <laughs> can um, someone whistle? One of our chiefs. <laughs> hey, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Barry Berman. I'm the vice chair of the Reading Select Board, and I want to welcome everybody tonight to. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'm kind of talked out from last night. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, my name's Barry Berman. I'm the vice chair of the Reading Select Board. And I, I want to welcome everybody tonight uh, to our downtown economic development community meeting. Um, I know this meeting kind of seemed a little ad hoc. Um, but I have to tell you, it's been about five or six years in the making that we're actually having this meeting. Um, it's, when, it's when Reading decided. What do we need to do to grow this town, um, to develop our tax base, um, and started a, a plan that really about five or six years ago um, that uh, culminated really in tonight um, why we're here. It's, a, it's like I said, five years in the making. So about five years ago, we, we, we did our homework. We needed to sort of figure out what are the things that we need to do to grow, because if I quote Jay Ash, our good friend Jay Ash, who is the Secretary of Economic Development, he says, towns like Reading, you grow or you die. Very, very simple. Because if we keep doing things the way we do, we're never going to be able to keep up with the costs of the services that we've come to enjoy. Um, and, when, and we're going to just basically be, go by the wayside as other towns develop their strategies. So we did our homework. Um, we planned the work. And then we worked the plan. Um, we analyzed our strengths and our weaknesses. And we worked with Professor Bluestone from Northeastern to develop um, an, uh, a, a, a self-assessment tool. What are we good at? What do we need improvement on? We analyzed those strengths and weaknesses. And then we developed a, a plan around three broad themes. One, we want to maintain what we already have. Two, we have to do all that we can to strengthen our downtown, strengthen our businesses, and make downtown a place where people want to come to. And then third, we have to maximize our opportunities, see what's available for us. We're not a town that's out on 495 with acres and acres of opportunities to build new things. We're a built out town. We have to strategically target um, and maximize those opportunities. Um, and we developed sort of three, a number of things along that plan. We got to 10% of our affordable housing. We developed a housing production plan to get to that 10%. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it's the right thing to do, and it's the moral thing to do, to have affordable housing in the town of Reading. But it also gave us control about what the next projects are going to look like. Uh, we, we put our destiny in our own hands. Another key piece is that we expanded the 40 yard to the downtown. That's, that was key. It gives the, our planning board the ability to shape individual projects as well as how those projects work together. And it allows us to hold developers accountable to the design guidelines that we think are important. And then we put projects where they belong. Targeted, managed growth, thoughtful. Where we, we put them where we were OK with new activity. So tonight, you're going to hear a little bit about kind of um, how those projects are coming along. We've actually permitted, since the last time we talked, five projects that are going to add over 200 households to the downtown within walking distance of the train and probably all the businesses that we've all come to enjoy downtown. That is going to change the phase. So what's next? This is now kind of the second phase. What's the next plan? Well, first of all, we need to talk about things like parking. Now that we're going to have all these places and we want people to come, where are they going to park? Placemaking. What are we going to do to recruit restaurants? There's talk about doing, making Reading a destination for the arts, an arts district, a farmer's market, foot traffic, and, the, and, and again, the parking. Another piece that we're not going to talk about tonight, per se, but it's really a really important part of our plan is Walker's Brook. Um, it was in the, I don't know if it was in the paper or not, and it kind of got glossed over, but Reading just this last week, Gene Delios, our assistant town manager, and Bob Lasher, our town manager, um, accepted an award um, from Lieutenant Governor Polito 
a housing choice award for $50,000, basically um, as a thank you for doing economic development the right way. That $50,000 grant is going to go toward figuring out what's next for the Walkersbrook area. So while tonight we're going to focus in on downtown, um, that's another key piece. Um, and, and we got that grant um, because of the fine work and the planning that we've done. None of this stuff happened by accident. It was thoughtful and directed managed growth. So tonight, let me just tell you quickly what's going to happen, and I'm going to turn the, the floor over. So um, Bob is going to talk a little bit, give some additional remarks. Then, um, then Matt Smith, who is um, our uh, Nelson Nygaard parking consultant, is going to give us a presentation uh, on the updated downtown parking study. Um, and this, um, I think everybody got their little um, polling devices. Um, this, that's going to be an interactive uh, exercise. Um, we're also going to hear from Jesse Wilson. Um, I guess it's Jesse Wyman now. I used to <laughs> call you Jesse Wilson. Um, who's going to give a presentation on the wayfinding project um, that we also got a grant for. Um, it's great to build all these things, but we got to get people to them, right, and make sure they know where they're going. Um, Julie Mercier, who's our economic development, uh, uh, community development director, is going to give us an update on the projects that we all spoke about. Um, and then Gene is going to work on some breakout sessions with, the with, with all of us so that we can get, some, get your feedback. This is not just us talking to you. This meeting is designed for you to talk to us because I think when we come out of this, I think the purpose of this is going to generate some ideas for the next phase. Um, I think we've done a really terrific job, um, Gene and Julie in and Jesse in particular, um, um, and, and Bob because he's smart enough to hire them all. Um, deserve um, incredible accolades for the work that they've done. Every city and town is trying to do what we're doing, right? They're trying to put their town on the map. They're trying to get development into their town. They're trying to get investors to come in um, and work in their town. And everybody's fighting for the same dollar, okay? But what, what um, Julie and Jean and Jesse have done is basically have gotten Reading on the map with key funders. Um, and so um, because they've developed a plan. And when Jay goes around the state talking about economic development, he has the Reading model in his hands. So um, I think we've done it right. Um, we've got a lot to do, and it's really exciting about this next phase. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to Bob, who's going to say a couple of things, and then we can get started. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. I'm Bob Lurlasher, and I'm highly aware there's a Red Sox game tonight, so I'll do my best. For the second time in a month, I've written down my remarks. I'm told I'm getting old. Um, last year, we had an economic development community meeting in this room in October, um, and we discussed our efforts as it was related to our 25 peer communities. Um, along with our then economic development director, Andrew Corona, and with economic liaison, Jesse Wyman, um, we took a two-pronged approach. First, different groups of us pairs and sometimes three visited as many communities of those peers as would see us. Uh, we got to almost 20 out of 25. We were looking for the magic solution to economic development, and the most surprising result was the then Burlington town manager, John Petron, who leaned in as if to tell us a secret, and he said, when they call, I answer the phone. Um, we, we learned that gravitational attraction of the CIP sector is the strongest attraction of business, which really doesn't help Reading. Um, our second approach was to comb through mountains of state data. <clears throat> the most surprising fact that I learned was that of the 25 communities, Reading's businesses paid an average wage to their employees of under $40,000, which ranked dead last in all 25 communities and highlights our retail business focus. As, as Barry mentioned, last Thursday I had the pleasure of joining Assistant Town Manager Jean Delios and Staff Planner Andrew McNichol in accepting a grant award from the state, acknowledging our comprehensive and integrated approach to both housing and economic development. Speakers included Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, the Executive Director of Mass Housing Finance Agency Crystal Cornegay, and the Undersecretary of the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, Janelle Chan. They each spoke in glowing terms about how the 19 communities that receive grants, which by the way, at 128 and inside 128, only included uh, Redding, Melrose, Beverly, Somerville, and Quincy. 
did right things in, in housing and economic development. I was very proud to have that outside recognition of the work that's been done by Gene, Julie, Jesse, Andrew, he doesn't have a J yet. Um, and it's been many, many hard years of work and, and it's very worth noting that that includes extensive volunteer work and public participation at meetings such as this. This afternoon I had the pleasure of meeting of some additional outside validation. I'm very happy to announce, Julie will probably know this, I'm happy to announce that the engineering firm Weston and Sampson is moving to 55 Walkersbrook, the old Keurig space, sometime next spring. They are bringing over 250 comparatively very well-paid jobs to Reading. Vice President and Director of Marketing Bob Goober explained their move from Peabody to Reading as having many components. You'll be a little surprised at the first one, ranging from the walkability of the site to near, nearby restaurants, which is clear, but they also liked the walking distance to Lake Quanapawa to the east and our commuter rail station to the west. Um, their firm is very familiar with town government as they've been involved in our water main work and our DPW site. Bob was especially familiar with the future commercial development opportunities at Walker's Brook and their work on, on that project may well have led to this happy result. He also noted, as did the state officials, that we do things right in Reading, and they were thrilled to be coming to this community. Reading is quite land constrained when compared to all of our peer communities, and future, develop will, future development will often uh, happen in and around neighborhoods, and perhaps this one remaining commercial parcel. To quote Crystal Cornegay, we are one of the few communities who have done exemplary work to balance the concern of current residents who have, and the need for additional house, housing units across the Commonwealth. It's a really important reminder that those new housing units, especially in the downtown area, bring economic development. Certainly we hope to continue to use a wide variety of tools and bring a lot more feet to your businesses in the years to ahead. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, State Senator Jason Lewis who has, has a few remarks. Thank you, Bob, and uh, good evening, everyone. I appreciate the chance to just say hello. Thank you for being here. This is a, a really impressive turnout. Um, it's, um, I think, apparent to all of us um, that a thriving uh, downtown that has a diversity of businesses and diversity of uses um, is uh, critical to the, the health and well-being of any community, um, and of, including, of course, Reading. So it's imperative on all of us to work together uh, whether we're in the public sector, the private sector, state government, local government, uh, developers, what have you, uh, residents, to do everything we can to support efforts around local economic development. And um, for myself and the other members of the Reading Legislative Delegation, Representative Jones and Representative Dwyer, um, this is very much what we see as, as our mission, is to work together with town government and residents um, and local businesses to support local economic development. Um, we do that in a number of ways. Uh, there's significant uh, state resources that are provided to support the schools. Uh, that's called Chapter 70 funding. Uh, also, um, unrestricted local aid, which is money that the town can use for various purposes. And then uh, funding also from the state to support local transportation and infrastructure. That's known as Chapter 90 funding. And that's uh, provided on an annual basis. Um, we also try to uh, work hard together with the town to look for grant opportunities um, from various state agencies, sometimes from federal agencies. You know, these are typically competitive to support those efforts. And, and, and um, really, it's a credit to, um, to Bob and Gene and the town staff and, of course, the members of the select board and, and other boards how successful the town of Reading has been in securing a range of different grants. And I represent six communities altogether. And I can tell you that, uh, as has been said, that Reading has been, has been very successful in showing proactive planning, you know, a thoughtful approach to economic development, to housing policy, and that is what the state's looking for in these grants. So, you know, the, the 50,000 grant um, for through the Housing Choice Program, very competitive. I was at that same ceremony with the Lieutenant Governor last week, and uh, Reading was one of the few communities. Um, recently, the town also got a, a grant from the Department of Conservation and Recreation that's going to help with some multi-use trails development along the Abrajona River. Um, also, a grant which was in the state budget for an initiative to support aging in place. 
So for our seniors, you know, want to stay in the community, we know there's various challenges for them. There's a lot of going on around innovative ways to help seniors stay in the community, and Reading's on the leading edge of that. And then the Downtown Initiative Grant, which is what funded the um, wayfinding effort um, that's going to be talked about more tonight. So those are great. A couple other quick things I wanted to mention. Um, Route 28 Main Street, we know that's a, it's in, been in bad shape. The good news is, if you haven't heard, um, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, which has jurisdiction over Route 28, um, the, has put out to bid the project to completely uh, repave and fix and make some other improvements to uh, Main Street. And the work is going to be starting as soon as the next construction season begins next year. So sorry for further delay, but um, that's going to be a major upgrade, um, both south of the downtown and, and north of the downtown. And then um, something else that I'm uh, personally very excited about is what's known as the Complete Streets Program. This was something that was uh, created actually from legislation that I filed um, a number of years ago. And it's basically a, uh, provides state funding, and it can be as much as several hundred thousand dollars, to communities that prioritize the idea of complete streets. And for those of you not familiar with this, the idea is not just to think about how to move cars back and forth, but how to support other modes of transportation as well. So obviously pedestrians, um, bicycles, um, access to public transit. So you think about the Reading downtown and all of that comes into play. How do we make it more easier and safer, more convenient for pedestrians to get around? way appropriate uh, bicycles, and then of course tying into the commuter rail and bus service, um, as well as obviously supporting uh, cars and, and other vehicles. So that's a, a program that Reading has really bought into, and I'm really excited about what the town's doing there, and is going to unlock hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional and new state funding to support those efforts, and that can be used to improve sidewalks for other um, downtown type um, improvements that then also supports the local business community. Um, at the state level, we are very cognizant and aware of the challenges facing our downtowns. Um, the downtowns, not just in Reading, but everywhere, are very dependent on the retail industry, of course. And the retail industry has faced uh, particularly um, uh, you know, unique challenges, of course, with online shopping and other changes in retail. We're seeing major, major challenges there. The uh, state senate actually formed a special task force last year, and it worked for about nine months, um, traveled around the state, took a lot of testimony from retailers of different sizes, different industries, looking at what the challenges are and ways to address those challenges. And there, there will definitely be further work on this um, to, to continue to find ways to help uh, both large and small uh, retailers, particularly in our downtowns. One initiative in particular that I'm um, uh, leading is an effort to create an office um, at the state level, an office of main streets. So it would be a specific office within our economic development um, uh, uh, department that would support local chambers of commerce and local main streets and businesses you know, on, on all of the efforts they have. So they'd be able to provide technical assistance, they'd be able to help um, find uh, resources that are out there, and in, in other ways just support local economic development. Our state long ago used to have something like that, but for some reason it, it uh, was um, you know, uh, done away with at some point. And that type of an entity has been pretty successful in other states. So we're going to keep working as much as we can you know, on, on initiatives like that and try to continue to partner wherever we can with Town of Reading you know, and other communities around local economic development. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear? Yep. I want to make sure this is working. Um, I'm going to try to just um, actually walk around a little bit as I'm talking, so I'm going to use this instead. But my name is Matt Smith, and I am a consultant with Nelson Nygaard. And we are a transportation um, consulting firm, more of a boutique firm who focuses much more on, I would say, the user experience. And one of our specialties is parking and what we call transportation demand management. Um, tonight, I'm just going to talk to you about the importance of what, how does parking relate to economic development? I'm going to talk about a, very briefly about a 2009 study that my firm did, and then the recent 2018 update, and then some draft recommendations. So first thing I want to just talk about really is what does parking have to do with economic development? A lot of people don't really 
put those two together. And I like to kind of start out with just an example. So here are two different images of town. This is actually a town in the Midwest, and this is actually a town up in coastal Maine. And I look at this and I say, okay, when you're talking to people, you would say, okay, if you want to go park somewhere, where are you going to want to go? Some of you might say, right here, because you don't have any problem at all. Um, but if you're going to go shopping, that's indicative that there's not much going on in that downtown. Over here, you've got, on a bad rainy day, you've got, first of all, no parking available on the street. You've got people walking around, everything. That is a very successful downtown. Someone might complain, though, oh my god, there's no parking. Well, there's a problem with both. Both of these places probably have a parking problem. This one has a problem because there's nothing to do and nobody wants to be there. This one is so successful that people are probably circling around. So first thing you have to remember in parking, if you have a parking problem, you have success. That's the first thing to do. And it's all about managing it to make it more effective. The least thing, the worst thing you want to do is this. When people are driving around, and trust me, I do this everywhere. Parking is emotional. People get very upset. Um, there's some interesting headlines recently in Danvers. Um, but I would just like to say, this is something you have to consider. You want to make sure that, first of all, you're actually using your existing parking inventory. Um, what we like to say is a best practice, 85% utilization. Um, that means there's some available, but you're using what you have. Um, but you don't want it to be so hard to get that you're never going to get these people back, particularly visitors. We just heard that you know about the difficulty with retail and in downtowns. If you don't set the right impression and you don't make your downtowns user friendly, um, and Trust me, I'm all for pedestrian and biking, but we live in a, the world where car is still king, um, and hopefully that's going to change, but you have to address it. If you don't, you're actually going to be hurting pretty bad. So let's get to it ready now. Your parking inventory here deals with many different users. You've got your commuters, which everyone knows. You've got your town business, the lot that there's a nice parking lot right at your town hall. You're also serving employees that work there. You've got many zones that allow two hour parking, but also all day employee parking with those who have permits. And then of course, you've got your customers. This is the lot that's actually um, just off of Main Street. Um, it's kind of tucked behind the CVS. So you're dealing with all of these different users. Each of them have different needs and different desires when they're looking for parking. So that's something we have to consider when you're planning. So we did a study many years ago in 2008, and I'm not even going to try to explain these maps. There's no point. They're very confusing, and you really have to get into the nitty gritty. But what it basically showed is that at your peak back in 2008, 2009, we actually did the data in 2008, the study was 2009, you really only hit about 50% total maximum utilization of your entire inventory. And that was really about 11 a.m. So that meant there was a lot of parking available. Um, what we noticed at that time is that the greatest demand, that's the red, was around the train station, and then some areas like around Main Street, and then Haven was starting to get busier down here. Now, let's move to 2018. We redid this study. Things have changed. There's a very different retail environment than there was just, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. So what we did is we looked at every single space within this area. And there are a total of almost of just over 3,400 parking spaces near downtown. That's a lot of parking. That, all those black areas, that's actually surface parking. Street parking, parking lots, private, public, et cetera. So one thing you have to consider is that given that people think there's no parking, that looks very different on that map. And with there's, there's 1,400 on street, and then there's 2,000 plus off street. So let's break it down a little bit. I'm going to get in a little bit of the nitty gritty of the map. So what we're talking about downtown public parking. This is the parking that anybody, any visitor can use. It's open to any per person who comes to downtown. The majority of that is in what you, I would say your core. It's all this like bluish green color. It's a series of on street and off street lots. And then what you also have is like, so this is like 202 between these two spaces. You've got then this dark blue, which is the town hall. Everything else is on street. Most of it's two hour. Some of it has what we would call, I'm going to go to the next slide, what we have is permit parking. So around here on the train, you've got a bunch of permit parking. That's all the purple. Conveniently, the color of what they use for the commuter rail. So it makes it a little bit easier to understand. Here, you've got these dotted lines in blue. This is public parking, but it's also permit for employees. It allows your employees to stay for the entire day in convenience. And then you've got what you would call a kind of some private parking that's only allowed by those employees. Add to that, now you get what we call private parking that no one probably thinks of as private parking. But this is private parking, the fact that it's owned by the landowner, not by the, not by the town. So you've got shopping center parking, small lots here, residential parking. There are 1,600 total spaces of that downtown. The interesting thing, I'm going to talk about this in a second, and it might be right here, is that the utilization of a lot of this parking is not what you think it is, particularly during the peak. So your peak, 
We did utilization. We literally counted cars every day um, for actually a day, every hour. And then we actually created what's your utilization, the percentage of spaces that are, are used versus what's available. What we found out is very similar to your last study in 2008, about 45% of, this is on a Thursday, um, were, 45% of them were actually utilized, similar to the 50% in 2009. So it hasn't really changed all that much. Your highest demand is, at, this is, sorry, that's at 1030 to around 1230, that's your peak. It's mostly your commuters, so obviously that fills up in the morning and stays that way. That's where you're seeing, you're seeing a little pink here and there, but mostly these light blues. Light, light blue means you're below 40% capacity. Some of these are almost at zero, to be honest with you. So you're not really hitting that bad of a time. Even the lot behind the CVS is only about 80%. Now, you could say that's your parking, but we're getting more specific these days. We're not just looking at the one day, one time, it suits all. Let's look a couple hours later, 12.30 to 2.30, your lunch crowd getting in. You're seeing a shift. Yeah, of course, people are still working. They're not leaving those spaces. But now you're starting to see the off of Main Street, the lot behind CVS, these are the pinks, these are where you're hitting your 91 to 100%. That's actually at capacity. Functionally, that's at capacity. There's maybe one spot of 10 that opens up and randomly. So you're seeing a switch there. So again, Train Depot, Town Hall, Main Haven Streets, particularly near where the newer development, newer, because actually I worked on the economic development today we're talking about several years ago, and that was a new building then, not so much anymore. So patterns are changing. Um, and then, you know, interestingly, okay, 6.30, 8.30, this is when you're talking to people who are coming to eat, things like that. Dead. No one's parking down by the train. Why would they? They're done with work. But, and there's a little bit here, it's not, it's not at the same level, but the majority of the pinks you see here now are actually on this on street. They're the most convenient spaces. Everybody, you know, ideally wants to park right in front of where they're going. It's the fun joke in parking. There's no parking except a block away, you know. So that's one of the things we keep talking about. So it's about where are you going? How are you finding your parking? Let's go to the next slide. We like to, that's the general like, patterns that you're seeing. So that leads to that. So we also like to look, what's the difference between your off-street? Those are those lots that are not right directly on street. When we first do this, we actually tabulate all of it, how much, what's the percentage use, and what's the percentage use off on-street. It looks like that your public off-street is in much greater demand than on-street. Mm, well, that's maybe true. However, let's go back one. Your lots are located next to some of your most active businesses. So of course that's going to fill up. Or in the daytime at the peak, that's going to fill up because those are considered off-street lots because of your train. But what you see is most of the pinks, it's not these lots off, off the street, it's actually on-street. So there's a lot of dynamics that are at play. Those on-street spaces are the most competitive to find. Um, and then the secondary is typically a lot behind. So what about all that private parking? And that's something that's very unique to talk about. Um, at the peak, you're utilizing but less than 40% of that parking spaces. That's businesses, your different you know, shopping centers. And while some of them, when you get up here in these smaller areas, are going to be higher utilized, there's a lot down south just off this map that are not highly used. So that's all playing into this. So the, reason, the reality of though is that you still have a lot of parking that's not being used. Maybe there's going to be strategies in the future that you can either share that parking. You can make agreements with the owners. You can actually work with business owners that need different parking at different times to actually um, lease the spaces or that maybe the town can lease the spaces and run it all together. Um, there's many different strategies to make it more efficient. So this is the main finding. Yes, it, the perception is there. Downtown Reading has available parking at almost all times. I, I would actually was originally put at all times, but there's always going to be that one event or something that might happen that's going to like prove me wrong. So why do so many perce people perceive that there isn't parking or that it's very difficult to park here? Well, let's just walk you through. So here's this, the Lowell Street and then right next to Main Street. People will drive down here, right near the Cafe Nero, all those things, high demand location. Yeah, it's full. And now you're like, oh, there's nowhere to park. I say that. I still say that, and I work in this field. But right around the corner, you can take that right, and there's a lot there that this is actually at the peak time. I'm actually sorry, this is in the evening, and our data showed about 75% of the spaces would, were taken, so 25% were available. That's what it shows. If you knew, if you're a visitor, that right around the corner, and then with a nice little entry through CVS or a pathway that you can get there, that's more likely to go. They're like, oh, no parking here. I'm going to wrap around, and I'm going to go to the next parking space. But nobody's going to know that. And that's a problem. Um, so another example, 600 feet up the street from, let's just say from that Cafe Nero area, not picking that out, you'll understand why I'm talking about it in a second, is 
open parking. And I've been working with the town now for about seven years in different capacities, and I've never had a problem finding a parking space up in that area, except on a really busy town hall night, and I still found a space. So on those off nights, there is parking, but it's not going to be right in front of the place you want to be. I want to make a comparison. So remember I talked about this being 600 feet? We keep hearing Market Street, Market Street. So easy. You go to Market Street. I go to Market Street. I live on the North Shore. However, if you're going to, like, say, Starbucks, here comes the Cafe Nero comparison. You're coming in here. Here's their faux Main Street, and you want to go to Starbucks. If you're 600 feet by walking, you're not even at the, you're just at the other end of, the, of that little, like, town square that they have. And you've sat down in traffic because people are backing up and going in, so it's actually taking you a long time. If you know, you can go back here, still, packed, until you get about 600 feet. This is just an example. So you're still walking 600 feet to get to that Starbucks. And I'll tell you, personal experience, if I can park here and I'm going to go there, I'm pretty psyched because I got that prime parking. That's your main street. That's how you have to start thinking about it. And that's how you're going to track businesses. Now let's, I talked Cafe Nero. I just, that's why it's a coffee and a coffee. It's a comparison. If you're here, this is a, not the best shot because Google removed some of these when they combine images. But here you are. If this was full, which our utilization shows is typically pretty full, that's a bummer, but four, 300 feet away where there's still 25% open spaces is right here, and you've got a nice little alley you can walk down. That is really convenient, and I like to argue as an economic development person, that's more convenient than going to Market Street. However, this is not. This is a lot of different streets, a lot of different regulations. Um, you know, you've got this is unregulated, this is two hour, this is some you know permit parking, this is other permit parking for residents, this is no commuter parking. It's this is not a shopping mall. And that's why I like to like kind of, wait, you're going down Haven Street. This is about a year old. And I liked it because the glare is in the sun. There used to be a parking sign right here. It's white and blue. People, if you don't know the town, you don't know that's there. You don't know that there's a nice parking lot right behind there. And if there's any glare, you're not even going to intuitively know that the color is wrong. Fortunately, you actually are doing signage. That's going to be nice orange and blue. And I have a personal fondness for orange. So it's very visible. It helps you to get there. What you're starting to do is you're starting to create an environment that is clearer and more, I would say, intuitive for those visitors to find your parking. Because that is designed. It is a green fuel. Well, actually, they redeveloped, I guess, part of the golf course. I think that this is made for shoppers. It's made for the car. Yes, they made a pretend Main Street. It's not an authentic Main Street. You know, it's, it's enjoyable, I'll admit it. But they had a sea of parking around it. It doesn't mean it's easier, and it doesn't mean you're getting to where you're going faster. I always think that's the most interesting thing. Oh, the mall is so convenient. You might, if you're going up here to Wahlburgers, you might be parked way down here, and you're walking 10 minutes. So is that any more convenient than parking in your downtown? I don't know. I beg to differ. Um, I don't think it is. I think it's all about the impression. And this is why we're talking about parking, because parking is not just a space that you put your car. Parking is part of the entire transportation network. It's part of your pedestrian network, because let's remember, everyone who parks a car is a pedestrian after they get out of it. So how do you connect from your car to the store you're going to, to the restaurant, to your house, et cetera, to your place of work? So like here, you've got you know Main Street, was it that 28? What's the word? I always forget. Um, Two-way, Main Street, very busy. This is not always exactly fun at rush hour. But these are, or is that up here further? No, that, I think that's it. But two, you have two here. But then you have a series of one ways. If you're going in this parking lot, for instance, you can only take a right out of here. That's not super convenient. I mean, personally, I think it would be great if you go left, because maybe then you know to get down here. But if you go into this lot, and you happen to go out this way, you have to take a right. Then you have to go all the way up here, up, wrong, one way, down here. And if you don't know better, you're just back in the same loop. That's not going to attract people to come back here. So you really have to start thinking of your parking system as one complete system. It is how you compete as a downtown. Now, the other thing is, okay, then you've got here, this two-way, this part I believe is Haven is two-way, then you go right, where are you going? There's no indication. So this is where we're going to start talking about some more specific you know, recommendations. But also, talking economic development. You've got a bunch of development coming. Great for your downtown. I think 200 plus units is the total. But not a ton more retail. I think it's under 15,000 square feet of total new retail. Actually kind of perfect. You want smaller retail in this day and age. I have a history in economic development. Smaller retail is much better than large floor plates. So that's good. But when all of this comes, yes, you're going to be, they're going to provide parking for the residents. That's great. Um, fortunately, you've lowered the parking requirements because this is probably more car light households. That's who chooses to live in downtowns. They usually have one, very rarely two. But that's going to add more people. 
and there will be more retail. How the shifts happen where that new retail is, is must be tracked. And that's part of why we, we're, pro we're providing this, this information because now the town can take what, we are, what we're providing, start doing their own counts over time and see how those patterns change. And that might change how you actually regulate it. So take that all in, in. I know it's a lot of information, but I'd like to think, think of this as an, a living, breathing place. That's what a downtown is. And the parking and the, the streets are just one of the pieces that make it whole. Everything is being connected. So in terms of parking, now we'll get a little more specific. I don't want to go crazy. But these were all these things that we recommended in 2018, 2008, 2009. The red ones, you actually did. You have actually did. You, you expanded the employee parking. You, you improved parking signing more than once. But now you're doing an entire wayfinding. That's even, even better. Um, You've incentivized the sharing of private parking. Um, shared parking, basically just like think of it, two different uses on the same lot at different times. It's really complicated, but um, you've actually allow it in your zoning, but there's no way to incentivize it yet. So, or it hasn't been done. That's something you can do. Um, reduced parking minimums, that was done in the 40R district. Also, really great thing that you did. Um, allows greater densities where you need it most. Um, you've expanded your bicycle rap, racks. Um, MAPC program did that, and you've installed at least one bus shelter because increasing public, public transit access is also a major parking management solution, as is improving pedestrian and bicycle. The more people who can walk into town who live by, um, the more parking that remains open for those visitors who you need to get that money. Because I'll be honest, you need people to come in. The spending potential just within downtown will not support an active retail. You need to get people from all around. So let's talk about 2018. These are the things that we think would be really helpful. Right now, the majority of your regulated parking in downtown is two hours. Um, is that, that's enough time to maybe, if you're middle of the day, get lunch and something like that. But if you want to come and go to multiple stores on a weekend, who wants to come where there's a two-hour limit? You might need four. You might need three. So we would, we would advise to actually increase that from two hour, maybe or maybe have some areas that are longer, some that are shorter. That will become in greater detail. The other thing would be to may potentially expand the employee parking permit program, maybe change where some of those parking spaces are to make sure that the, the spaces for customers are, that are most needed, those closest to the stores, um, are actually available or are potentially available. You don't want your employees, and if there's any business owners, and if you're parking in front of your store, I'm going to encourage you to stop doing that. That is actually one of the, the things that will hurt a downtown more than anything. When a, when a store owner parks in front of their store for eight hours, you've now lost your customer. So I'm going to preach a little there. Um, so the other thing is maybe using better enforcement technologies. First of all, don't be, don't be crazy about your enforcement. If you're trying to get more people down here, you want to be very cautious. If you're like at literally making a run like every half hour and ticketing everybody, you're going to turn people away um, because somebody might forget or they missed it by two minutes. I just think that's not the best thing. You only want to do that when you are in the highest of demand um, area. Um, and then critical, enhance your parking information. I was the former traffic and parking person in Salem. Um, right now, not a fun place to be. But we had great information about parking. There was maps online. We had we improved signage throughout. We've changed rates. We've done things to actually, and we've actually hit that perfect 85% utilization target, except in October when who knows what's happening. Um, but so let's think about this now. The other piece is it's not just the regulation, it's the public realm. This is an environment. So really important, keep improving signage and wayfinding. Make sure you're doing that um, to make it as easy as possible. And then, you know, remember, there's this amazing thing called, you know, car sharing and things like Uber and Lyft. More and more people, even in the suburbs, are using these, particularly when they're going out to dinner and things like that. Maybe start encouraging that, to open that, by having a designated, like, Lyft and Uber drop zone. Um, we do a lot of curbside management. The entire world of parking and the curb is changing because of new technologies. That's a good way to get, say to people, okay, good. You can even have, you can even do partnerships with them where maybe a, re a restaurant decides to give a discount as, as their ride. There's many different things you can do. All of these things will actually help to open up parking for those who want it. After you do that, maybe get into some more medium term strategies. Like we're talking, the short term are like first year, one to three. This is more like two to three to two to four, depending on what you do. So continue to mark to monitor that parking utilization. You're going to get the data for every block in your downtown that we did. You can keep doing that. And honestly, it's kind of fun. You just walk and count cars. Um, at least it's fun to me. But um, you can also then expand your on-street parking supply. We've noticed a lot of your spaces appear long. You need to be about 18 feet. If they're 22, 
20, want, like you, if, you, if you make sure you're using them as they are, you can maybe squeeze a few more spaces in places. Look for opportunities maybe for some angled parking. Haven maybe could, op could offer that. So increase your supply without having to do a major infrastructure project, because I know all too well how expensive that is. Um, the other thing would be also to incentivize and encourage shared parking opportunities. A lot of people have always said, okay, a town or a city needs to start working with all these private owners and then make these deals happen. Um, from firsthand experience, I think often the, pub, the private sector together on their own can do a better um, job at that. Um, for instance, if a restaurant deals with a bank directly, a lot of times the idea of, of it being more of a one business using that parking, the more there's a fear, less fear of liability, quite frankly. Um, there's a couple of restaurants I can think of, one in Lynn, um, actually, and then one in Salem that have done that, and that's been very successful for their customers. So it doesn't have to be a huge program. It can actually be the town actually maybe hooking up some people to talk like, oh, you're next to this bank. You want to be a popular restaurant. Maybe you should use your parking at night. Great. Then there's money change hands, even better. So there, those are ways you can really do that. Um, the other thing, public realm again. Connections to parking lots. Make those alleyways where there are, like that one next to the CVS cafe area, make it as, as as bright and as maybe you can use public art, things like that, make it a draw. Um, bike facilities, again, get more people biking in here. That's a great way to do it. More bike racks, be creative with it, um, and then eventually we'll talk the next day. Um, maybe even look at valet programs. That's something you can do once you get that to that point where certain areas are really overly parked. Um, and then finally, the long terms. This would be what you call, you're not ready for pricing. You're, you have so much available parking right now, maybe not in a few key spots, but if you start charging them, people are just gonna move to the free parking down the street. Once all of these come in and you have new development, and as you're watching the utilization, once you hit about 80%, 75%, you really need to start considering um, pricing, because if you're at like a 70% total utilization, you're hitting areas that are well over 85%, 90, 95. So that's when you would start thinking, we call demand, the key, the, the most competitive areas would be the highest price parking and then it would just gradually go cheaper. You might have a free zone farther on the periphery, maybe like something 50 to a dollar or an hour in the middle. But that you're not ready for that yet. Um, payment collection technologies, it's amazing what you can do today with, I mean, there's smart meters that will tell people um, how long they've been there. You can upload, you can pay with them with an app. You can do all these kinds of things. You would actually want to make sure you're looking at those technologies that will provide you data, but also um, better revenue collection. Um, there's a really great thing in Massachusetts, um, just actually passed this into law, I think about a year and a half ago, two years, parking benefit districts. They're special districts where any monies that are collected within your parking district, which is essentially where you're getting revenue, can be put into a specific account that can only be spent on the, on the actual management and operations of the parking as well as infrastructure, sidewalks, pavement other programs, signage. Um, it's kind of like what you would call a business improvement district, light, um, and you don't have to get, it's not a tax, it's actually then using the users of those facilities to pay for some of those improvements. Um, becoming very popular in other parts of the country and now increasingly here. Increase the employee permit fees when you get really competitive, it's pretty cheap right now. Um, and then focus enforcement efforts at the peak to make sure that, you're, that the parking is turning over and people aren't abusing the system. And then finally, this is where you get, okay, fine, you can add bike racks, you get people, this is when the other things would be, really make sure you're getting those big bike connections into your downtown. Once it's thriving, people are really gonna be coming in and if they can get in with a bike and park for free and they're active, that's a good way to do it. Um, and then your auto circulation, this could be everything from changing some one ways to two ways or switching the direction. I, we didn't analyze this, but that's something you should look at. Um, you could also implement things like street diets to calm and quiet. Um, certain roads that you want at lower speeds and make people feel more comfortable, um, and things like that. So many different opportunities to actually really, like I would say, delve into your parking to support the economic goals of your community. And I know it's boring, but it's parking, it, it's emotional, but it's also really, if you don't get it right, you're gonna hurt the overall growth. You also have to remember, this is like, I like to end now, technology is changing the way people get around. You also need to make sure what you're doing is adaptable. Um, there's a, fewer and fewer younger people are driving, so think about that, where that's going. Technology is changing, how we actually get picked up and dropped off, and don't even go to the autonomous, no one knows what's happening with that, so we're not going to pretend, but things are changing. Just be ready to adapt. So one thing that we thought we would do um, is just, here's your keypads, where if everyone wants to grab them. Essentially what we're doing, these are all these draft recommendations that we've been working on. Um, we wanted to get a little feedback tonight just to kind of test the temperature, understand what people think, 
Um, and then that will help guide us. We'll be then working with, um, you do have a really great staff. Um, and I think that's what's really great is that they are, I've been working in economic development, parking, market for years, and you do have a, a town that's actually looking at this right, um, and it's comprehensive. So the more input you can all give, the better I think the outcome will be. So here's going to be some of these fun little questions. How would you best describe yourself? So you're going to hit A, B, C, or D on that on the keypad. I think, yep, OK, cool, I can see this. I haven't done this in a while, so bear with me. Um, when we get closer, how many people are here? Do we have many people are here? Okay, cool. So when I get when I see that little number moving up when it's close right up here, when it starts approaching 60, I know I can close it out. So if you haven't hit your button, whatever the last button you hit, we'll actually read, we'll do it. So, ooh. okay, well it seems like it's been static for a while. So let's see where we are. So this is going to give us a real time of it. So 65% of you are residents. We've got a couple um, business owners, and then also some workers, and then. 16% that are more than one. Great. So now let's go to the next one. How old are you? This is actually an important question because when you're talking about the overall environment, um, you do have to start planning for people of different ages and abilities. Um, and that's one of the reasons we ask this. Okay, it looks like we're about the same as we were. Okay, so we have a spread. Um, we definitely have a higher representation of 65 or older, um, but that's actually a trend that's happening throughout the region. So the population is aging, so that's actually really important when we're considering all of these different pieces. Next one. How long have you lived or worked in Reading? I think we have 43 people. It's very, con oh, 44. Ooh, we have another one. So let's see where we are here. Oh, wow, so more than 10 years. So you have a lot of long-term. So people are very familiar with your downtown. Does everybody know where the parking is? That would be the interesting. I should have asked that question. It's not coming. Anyway, um, OK, why do you come downtown most? Think carefully on this one, because there's a couple of weird options or different options. Okay, that's good. Okay, so Eaton Shop is the, is really the main thing people are doing are all of the above. So that's good. You're using your downtown for many different reasons. So that actually might speak to one of the other questions that's going to come up. So when you come downtown, where do you like to park most? And so on street, that's really that's your public on street parking. Um, so want to make sure off street are those few lots that you have here. Um, private parking would be that's if you work, that means if you're just coming here and you're parking a designated spot, and then private parking would be like a shopping center, not one that would be regulated by the city. And then commuter is pretty obvious. You're totally right. That's. That's per I, that I can't. I actually can't believe I forgot that. Anyway, thank you. That's really good. So off street. So most people are going to the lots. Interesting. Oh, on street. That's what I meant. Sorry. Um, I was just looking at the next one. So then off street. That actually hits about where the percentage of when you actually look at the total spaces versus the number of on streets. So that's kind of interesting in that sense. So you like the convenience. That's really what that shows to me. How often are you coming downtown to park? Okay. 
Okay, so two to three times a week. That's good. I mean, that means that there's people who are coming down here frequently. Um, this isn't like a once or like a ghost town where people think, oh, stay away. So that's really encouraging for your future economic development. Also, when you're actually, this is great information to when you're actually trying to attract retailers. If you have people coming two to three times a week, that's a lot of eyes that are on their potential store. Um, so how long do you typically stay when you're down here? We're in downtown. We're at a consistent stop. So less than an hour, so it's, it seems like it's more convenient. So that's something that would be interesting to delve into to understand maybe why. Um, and that could sometimes be the retail mix or the main reason you're coming here. Very few people are staying for three or four hours, but I think that's also indicative of some of the economic goals you're actually trying to achieve, what is going to make people want to stay downtown longer. Um, OK, do you find parking easy to find? Interesting. That one was easy. Got everyone. Yeah, so that's. I mean, that's actually really positive. So a lot of times we go where I go, you would see the exact opposite bar chart at the end. Um, is more parking needed for employees, in your opinion? And if you're not, if you're unsure, just hit C. Not sure, but yeah, 30% of you. I mean, that's actually, it's actually pretty good. So I think that's something to actually address and start to thinking about what's the best strategic way to do that. Um, and then, would you prefer adjusting parking time limits to allow them more than two hours? The majority of your spaces are two right now. Okay, so yes, I think that's that's something we clearly hear. I think the way that downtowns are changing and people are more interested in the experience, we're hearing more and more in communities that people want a little more time to park. So that's that's very consistent with a lot of the trends that we're looking at. Um, and then I guess this, this is more if you're thinking, think I want you to think in this from not someone who lives here, but if you were a res if you were a visitor, if you had sent someone, you're saying, oh, come meet me at this restaurant, and they're going to try to park. Think of it that way. Wayfinding is directional. Okay. So yeah, that I agree 100% with that one. <laughs> and then that's the end. Um, I just want to say thank you for participating in that. I'm, I'm going to be around after the meeting if anyone has any questions for me. Um, but we have a busy agenda, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jesse now. Sorry, we have to save this so we don't lose the polling. Sorry, I'm really short, so I'm going to bring this down. Can everybody hear me? All right. I'm Jesse Wyman. I am the Economic Development Liaison for the town. And we're going to segue right into wayfinding and branding. Um, that last question sort of led us right into it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So what is wayfinding and branding? Simply put, wayfinding is essentially a system of information that help people navigate a particular environment. Malls have wayfinding, airports have wayfinding, this library has wayfinding. So 
we're thinking it about our downtown and parking signage. How do we get people to navigate easily through our downtown? Branding is a system of graphics, typefaces, fonts that help identify a community, can be used to attract businesses, visitors, and also provide a sense of place. So why even do wayfinding and branding? Why are we thinking about it in terms of economic development? Well, from the experts and from a lot of the planning we've done over several years, we have started to see a common recommendation, a common action being improved signage and you need a marketing plan and you need branding. Going back to even 2009 when Nelson Nygaard did the original study, parking signage was a recommendation then and it's still a recommendation. Our economic development self-assessment tool in 2014 also identified um, branding and marketing as a weakness in Reading. And that was simply because we just didn't have any. We don't do branding, we don't really have a strong marketing plan, so that was why it was identified as a weakness. And then in 2014, we also did a cultural district exploratory study where we looked at whether Reading would be a good candidate to adopt a cultural district. And that report also said you need to develop branding. You need to have this in place to attract businesses, to attract uh, visitors to your, to your town as a destination point. And then moving into 2015 when we did our economic development action plan, signage was also identified as part of a larger parking strategy as a recommendation to implement. So once again, we have Nelson Nygaard back here as part of um, that recommendation, you know, the idea of this larger parking strategy and we're now looking at signage. And then also in that plan, the Economic Development Action Plan, recommend creating a brand and marketing strategy. So we're hearing this over and over again. You need signage, you need marketing, you need branding. But the obvious reason, as Matt alluded to, is that if you can't find parking, you may get frustrated and just not park at all. You may think that going to Linfield or going to even Redstone is going to be easier to park. There's readily available parking, but as Matt clearly showed, it's not really that clear. But what happens is our businesses suffer, our downtown suffers, and if we can implement signage better, it will help make our downtown more accessible and easier to navigate. So what do we do? So our planning department applied for a grant in 2016, and we received that grant. It was in the amount of $15,000 to work with a consultant to establish a wayfinding and branding program. And the first step was to create an advisory committee, which was made up of 14 people from a wide, um, from a wide variety of backgrounds. We had um, someone from the, we had Barry from the select board. We had town manager, assistant town manager. We had planning staff. Uh, we had a couple members from the business community, chamber of commerce, public safety, uh, and all these folks worked really closely with the consultant to help identify and um, come up with a design for the wayfinding program. And they first met in June of 2017. They continued to meet with the consultant for about six months, going through um, a process that started with ideation exercises. So the consultant worked with the committee to really identify what, what is Reading, ask them questions like, name one word that comes to mind when you think of Reading, name a color that comes to mind when you think of Reading, and then fill in the blank, Reading in the future looks like this. Uh, all these questions were asked to help inform the consultant's design, which the committee reviewed, and over a series of the six months, the design was refined and ultimately was prevent presented to the business community at a breakfast meeting this last January. And with their um, feedback and uh, review of that, we took it to the Board of Selectmen for approval later that month. Is that coming up? Oh yes, this is, okay. So I wish you could actually see what the approved design looked like. Imagine the black, part of the black is blue and red. Apologies, I'm not sure why this isn't showing up correctly, but what this is showing is essentially a family of elements where there's uh, various sign types that have different applications. So we've got parking signs that would be used to identify parking. We've got way, uh, uh, gateway signs that would be used at the boundaries of the town to help identify that you've arrived in Reading. Uh, we even have banners that would be placed in the downtown to help say, hey, you're here, this is, this is Reading. Uh, we even have signage that's more pedestrian in scale that would work to help 
uh, pedestrians navigate our downtown. So a lot of different signs that would be great for different applications. But what we're going to be focusing on is the implementation of the parking signs. And as Matt had mentioned, we do have a lot of challenges with our downtown. Uh, the parking can be somewhat difficult to locate. It is behind a lot of buildings. And if you're not familiar with Reading, you may not know it's there. We also have a challenging system of one-way streets, which creates a unique situation where if you miss an opportunity to park, you may not know how to get back around. I'm sure some of you have experienced this yourself, where you may get to, um, to the Brandy Court lot or miss the turn to the Brandy Court lot, and then you have to find your way somehow around town through the one-way streets to another parking opportunity. So what we're hoping to do with this wayfinding program is really create a, a, a system where if you miss, first of all, identify the opportunities, but if you miss it, you know how to get back around. We'll also be looking at areas where we just don't have signage at all, so identifying signs for uh, new locations. This is looking um, southbound. This is Main Street and Lowell Street. Heading into our downtown, there's absolutely no signage here saying, hey, you've arrived. There's parking ahead. So situations where we need to make the driver aware that they've arrived in Reading, and we do have parking, and we would like you to stay and shop. We'd also be looking at replacing existing signs. Our existing signs are green and white. They're small. They blend into the landscaping. They're difficult to see. So with our new design, which you unfortunately couldn't see, is orange and blue, um, is very bright and prominent. And then we also want to really hone in on where we need to put additional signage to create that looping system to make sure that nobody gets frustrated and just leaves. So here's a rendering showing a before and after. The one on the left is our existing signage, and it really just blends into the tree and the church behind it. You can barely see it. On the right, the orange and blue, which hopefully is coming up right, great, is very bright. It gives that visual cue to drivers to turn. There's parking down there. Again, similarly, this is the sign that shows you how to get into the Upper Haven Street lot, which is behind the CVS. It makes a big difference just having these larger colored orange and blue. And this is the one that was installed. Matt had talked about it. Uh, the sign came down during snowplow operations, I believe, and we replaced it with the new design. And even from a distance, you can see the orange pop, and hopefully we'll give that advanced cue to drivers so that they don't miss the opportunity. That's really the goal. Um, but like I said, if we do miss that opportunity, we want to create a system where we help people loop back around. So as far as installation, we're going to continue to work internally and work with parking and traffic officials to finalize location, probably get some additional feedback from Nelson Nygaard, as well as feedback from this meeting, whether or not there's specific areas that you find problematic and incorporate it into uh, an installation plan. So that's all I have for wayfinding and branding. I apologize that the rendering did not come out correctly. I'm sure we can follow up with you guys if you have not seen that, that rendering before. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Julie, who's going to talk about what's actually happening in town. Okay, so... Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I've seen a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces, which is really encouraging. Um, and thank you to the presenters who went before me who um, discussed some things that are happening now that fit really nicely into what I like to call Reading's culture of planning. Um, planning and economic development in Reading would not be so successful without a cross-section of people being involved, um, from staff, elected officials, um, consultants, and residents. Um, so it's really great. Reading has a long and rich culture of planning that dates back many decades, long before I worked for the town. Um, many of the things that are happening now are the result of many years of preparation and planning. Um, it can be hard for us as planners to anticipate what's coming, um, but we do our best to be proactive. And I just like to say, um, we're doing our homework. So taking a line from Jean, we like to, you know, plan our work and work our plan. And here's a list of plans and guidelines and studies that have been done over the past decade or so. The ones that are highlighted in bold are things that you're hearing about tonight or things that we were working on um, in 2018. And the 
Economic Development Action Plan at the bottom, which is highlighted in red, is something I'm going to delve into a little more deeply um, further into my presentation. And so just to take a moment, if you are overwhelmed by all of the information that's being presented tonight, um, we are going to put tonight's presentations online tomorrow at the link, the same link that you may have used when you RSVP'd for this um, community meeting. And at the bottom of your agenda, there's all, the link is also listed there. Um, and you, as well as our contact information, so if you're driving home and you think of something, you can always send an email to any one of us um, in town hall. And that list of plans that I just showed you on the prior slide, um, the links to those, to those, the Town of Reading plans and economic development plans um, are up here on the screen and are in the presentation. They'll be posted online. So um, to delve a little deeper into something Barry mentioned in his opening remarks tonight, when we look at all this work that we've done over the years um, and we are focusing on managed growth, we can distill all this planning and these planning efforts into three main priorities. Priorities um, are listed up on the screen, um, keeping the downtown vital, preserving what's important, and being queued up for opportunities. So I'm gonna just sort of explain a little bit about what I mean here. Um, the downtown, as Matt said, is a living, breathing place. It's the heart of the community. It's very important that we keep it beating. Um, it's, it's also a focus of many of the planning efforts that we do. Um, before my time, we had an economic development committee that worked um, with small businesses downtown on peer-to-peer -peer small grants for building facade and signage improvements um, and undertook some um, studies about best retail practices. Um, and there were also streetscape improvements that happened on Upper Haven and Maine in 2009 that I'm sure you're all aware of. And then fast forwarding to today, you heard about our wayfinding initiative from Jesse and about our updated parking study from Matt. Um, and those two things are very focused on the downtown, primarily focused on the downtown. In 2017, town meeting voted to expand the downtown smart growth district. Um, and so that's actually resulted in a number of mixed use projects, which I'm going to describe in a little bit. Um, that are either um, under construction or coming soon in the downtown. I'm sure many of you are aware of them. Um, and we're really excited about those projects because they're gonna bring more people to the downtown. We're gonna have more people working downtown during the day and people living downtown at night um, to help keep the businesses that are open at night um, you know, vital. Planning officials at the state level have recently said Things like it's important to attract millennials and it's important to be pro-growth so your downtown doesn't die. So this is one of the reasons why we continue to focus on the downtown. With that in mind, it's also important that we preserve what's important. We can't forget that we have some things in town that are historical. Um, we have existing residents living in the downtown that we need to be mindful of when we continue to expand. To that end, the Community Planning and Development Commission is currently working on tweaking the downtown design guidelines for the next phase of downtown smart growth projects that may be coming in the pipeline. So that we can um, offer broader protections for those existing residential uses and historic features. Another um, thing that we work on almost every year is you know updates to the zoning bylaw. So the zoning bylaw is constantly being tweaked to respond to the shifting needs to say, this is something that we've allowed for many years, but maybe we need to redefine it or rethink about it um, given what we know might be coming. And you might be wondering, how do we decide what's important? So that's really an ongoing community conversation and that's why we have these workshops so that we can get feedback about what's important. And at every public meeting that we have, when we hear from residents, we're hearing you tell us what's important. And it's, it's, those are valuable meetings for us because we go back and we say, look, we always hear about parking at these downtown meetings. Let's update our parking study. So that's an example. And finally, um, we like to be queued up for opportunities. So it's important for us not to leave too much on the table and not to lag behind our peers. The economic development self-assessment tool that was done in 2014 identified a number of things that Reading could do to try to keep up with peer communities. Um, 
and our Economic Development Action Plan did as well. So with that in mind, um, you know, we try to plan for economic growth and be proactive. We um, recently worked on streamlining our permitting process. We created a business guide for new businesses when they're coming into town so they can understand better our permitting process at Town Hall. And we work to help develop developers navigate town processes as much as we can so that we're not just dismissed as being not business friendly. Um, we also try to keep up with state mandates. You guys are probably very familiar with Chapter 40B, the affordable housing mandate in town and um, in the state tonight. Having a production plan gives us leverage over future developments that come. Um, and then we also try to adopt and embrace state programs so that when we do apply for grants, we can check off the boxes. Do you have a complete streets policy? Yes, we do. Are you a housing choice community? Yes, we are. Um, we've adopted 4DR, which shows that we're committed to mixed use and we're committed to multifamily downtown. And we've also entered into a community compact. So all of these things give us a leg up in the eyes of the people who hold the purse strings at the state level when we apply for grants. They help us stay relevant and they help us emphasize that really cool things are happening in Reading. So, with that in mind, um, the downtown is growing. These are all projects that you may or may not be aware of. Under construction right now, we have Schoolhouse Commons on Woburn Street, which is 20 units of rental housing. And we have the Met at Reading Station, formerly known as Reading Village, which is 68 units of rental housing. Coming soon, we have our 4DR projects. The 24 Gold Street project, 55 units and 3,500 square feet of commercial space. Um, and then we have our Main Street project, the former Sunoco site, um, 31 units and 2,500 square feet of commercial space. And not last, last but not least, Postmark Square, which is the um, redevelopment of the post office property, 50 units and 8,500 square feet of commercial space. So these projects are all going to bring people into our downtown, more people into our downtown, I should say, since a lot of you live downtown already. Um, okay, so I bear with me on this one. I know it seems like a heavy slide. The next couple slides are also pretty <laughs> heavy. Um, but I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about the Economic Development Action Plan um, and this give you a status update on where we are with the goals and strategies in that plan. There are a lot of goals and strategies in the full plan, which is available online at one of the links that I showed you earlier. But what I did is I, I took out all of the strategies that don't relate to the downtown. So what you're seeing here is just things that relate to the downtown. I'm sure you can't read it. And I'm just going to summarize them for you and try to get through this quickly. Um, and I, I highlighted some key words in red. Um, so one of the, th this first slide is near as uh, long-term actions actually from 2018 to 2022. And look, here we are. Um, in the long term already, being 20, almost the end of 2018. The first recommendation here on the screen talks about develop, developing and implementing a comprehensive parking strategy um, with also the installation of signage to indicate locations of parking lots. So those are two things you just heard about. I don't need to say anything additional. Um, the next recommendation on this slide talks about making infrastructure investments to create a safe and welcoming pedestrian environment. Um, and with our complete streets, there's complete streets grants and there's capital budgeting um, for sidewalks. Um, so we continue to work to improve um, the downtown in terms of infrastructure. The third and last um, recommendation on this slide talks about um, engaging with local and regional entities to market redevelopment potential in Reading. Um, and so that's something that um, we've, uh, we've, we've made some progress on. We, there were past efforts made by the Economic Development C Committee and past efforts by our former Economic Development Director who no longer works for the town. Um, and we have ongoing collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce. But we're thinking in terms of a downtown organization um, that might be the next step for the town is to figure out a way to manage the downtown differently um, than we do now. So um, getting into the near term, Recommendations from the Econ Economic Development Action Plan. Again, I will just try to boil this down. And the, the um, text in red, which I understand you probably can't read, um, those are the important things that I'm going to mention. They all kind of lend themselves nicely, we think, to um, establishing a downtown organization. Um, so I'll just read a few of them. 
um, really quickly for you. So um, we ha there are ongoing efforts being made um, on, on some of these, which I'll mention briefly in a minute. But um, quickly, just to list a few of them, one of them is convene a group of stakeholders to develop a brand identity. Um, hold networking events for downtown business owners. Work with local businesses to plan activities and events. Connect business owners with programs to help strengthen and expand their businesses. Um, and identify a team of people who can champion economic development. So um, we, we have recently established an economic development webpage on town, which has a map of vacant spaces throughout the town. We have a newly updated downtown business map, which Jesse just completed recently. And we have copies of outside on the table if you want to take one when you leave. Um, it's really beautiful. She did a great job. Um, we continue to work with the Chamber, with Arts Reading, with the Garden Club to help coordinate events like the Fall Street Fair um, to end downtown trick-or-treat. We did a cultural district study in 2014 to find out if we could become um, a cultural district here in Reading, what the feasibility of that would be. And we continue to apply for these downtown initiative grants from the state. Um, one of those grants was for the Wayfinding Project. And then another one um, that I'm going to apply for this year is for a downtown organization. Um, to help us take, to really help us make progress on some of these recommendations in the Economic Development Action Plan. Um, and then this is uh, the last slide of this um, style, but it's just a few more recommendations from the plan that really lend themselves potentially to a downtown organization. So all of those, um, all that text that was in red, I pulled out and it's listed here. Um, and like I mentioned, one of the upcoming initiatives this year is to apply for another grant from the state um, for technical assistance with developing a local strategy for downtown management. Okay. So you might be wondering what I mean by downtown organization, and I'm not at all I'm an expert in this, which is why we would apply for a grant for technical assistance. Um, but there are a few different ways that you can do it. Um, Matt Smith mentioned parking benefit districts earlier tonight, and that is something that you, you basically need a revenue stream for, so I don't think we're there yet. Um, and it's very focused on parking and infrastructure, um, where we probably want an organization that will help our local businesses as well um, in different ways. So there are nonprofit examples like the Main Streets Organization in Wakefield, the Local First Organization in Brookline, um, the Lawrence Partnership. Um, and then there's you know, the possibility of expanding staff capacity to take on something like this. Um, and there's also volunteer groups that work on things like this. So there are different ways to slice and dice how a downtown organization can be um, organized and, and managed and funded. And that's something that we think that you know, if we can get this grant and we can get assistance with that, um, that will help us, you know, achieve or at least push forward a lot of the initiatives in our economic development plan. So with, uh, with this, I'm going to close my presentation and actually facilitate a breakout your feedback on a lot of these things that we've discussed tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all the presenters. I think everybody did a great job. And um, it was a nice trick that Jesse came up with to um, pique your interest on what the real colors are in the presentation. Um, that's an old trick, so congratulations, Jesse, for that one. Um, but I wanted to remind everyone that on your agenda, we included the links. So when you go home tonight, and I know you won't be able to sleep till you get those colors, um, it's right at the bottom of the agenda. You can go online, and uh, maybe through the magic of technology, if we can figure out how to work it, we'll pull it up. But um, that'll be something for uh, do over your coffee tomorrow morning. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to break up into groups, and you guys are going to do the work. I know the polling devices were a lot of fun. How many people have done that before? Or OK, so we have some new people to that. Um, we saved the presentation, so when you go online and look at the colors, you'll be able to see those results of the polling device, too. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to break up. You should have a number on your name tag that tells you what table you're on, what group you're in, and that all of the tables have been numbered. So before you get up and go to your assigned table, I just want to tell you what it is we're going to be doing. 
Um, these are the questions that you, we're going to ask the groups to work on. And um, we didn't give a lot, so we try to make this easy. We're going to take about 30 minutes for the groups to work on the questions. And um, we're going to ask you to please assign someone in your group as the scribe and the spokesperson. And um, staff will be available to walk around. If the questions are too hard, we'll help you um, with the answers very happily. Um, but we really want the, the, the input to be from you people. Um, this is part of what we do in these workshops is we get the feedback. As I think everyone said in their presentations, we want to hear from you tonight as much as hopefully you, know, you heard from us. Um, so um, we will come back at 9 o'clock. Um, and as I say, we're here for questions. If anybody needs any help, just give a wave. Thank you.
for all your hard work. Um, we're really getting excited to hear your ideas. Um, so we're going to go in reverse order, and we're going to start with table six and hear what this group has to say about some ideas and recommendations. Tony, thank you. Uh, thank you all. For question one, really we're concentrating on the flow of traffic in the downtown. The problem with part of the parking is that if you miss it, you have to travel four or five blocks to be able just to turn around and come back. Uh, we're looking at improving the CVS lot and back so that perhaps either we reverse the flow of traffic so you're coming in off a of haven or even have a two lanes of traffic on Main Street, and I'm sorry, on Woburn coming into and out of the lot. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the details and the weeds, which we probably shouldn't have. Um, for two, rarely we were looking more at um, some sort of transportation between Walkersbrook and downtown, the train station, either a shuttle bus or a trolley system, something to move people back and forth. We didn't get into questions three or four. Um, there was a question on if you were going to open a restaurant or a small business, where exactly would you cite it? Uh, one of the issues I have is that if I'm going to try and open a small office, be it a lawyer or a dentist, where can I purchase a small building and actually have an office? Uh, I think Woburn Street, we might be able to do something there where you can start having residential businesses where you're not changing a house. It still, still looks like a single family home, but you can have an office with just a little bit of expanded parking. Thank you, and I stand corrected. This is table four, for the record. Okay, table five. Um, so we uh, talked about uh, people moving being uh, one of the one of the main things that we wanted to do on question number one, which is uh, what the town should be planning for. So we wanted to uh, kind of create a corridor between the downtown area and the Walkersbrook area as far as uh, what the town should look for inf infrastructure, upgrade some of the bike areas, um, the covered the cover the bikes, and um, do some more directional signage, and some sheltered uh, buses. Uh, more bus shelters need to be sheltered. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what we talked about um, for the most part. I don't know if anyone else wants to add something. Thank you, table five. Now, table six, Shanna. Thank you. I'm Shanna Cahalan. I work at Reading Cooperative Bank, and I'm president of the chamber. Uh, we have a really diverse group here, so I thought everybody brought great ideas. We have someone on the finance committee, resident, commercial leasing, part of the arts groups. So ours is pretty uh, uh, widespread. Uh, one of the most obvious things I think that we found was that this is a great piece, and it would be awesome if it was mailed to all of the residents so that people um, know all of the options to them and where all the parking is. So that was kind of one of the most obvious things that could be. Oh, oh, I think, oh, this is the map that Jesse uh, created. They're available at the front. Um, let's see, one of the things that we thought would be great was if there was, there seems to be a great space for uh, kids to do art here in the community and also the seniors, but maybe some sort of a space for um, adults in our area. Um, let's see, the farmer's market we think is a fantastic thing, but it's hard to park down there when people are at the train. So maybe moving that over here to Washington Park or Memorial Park might be great. Um, we'd love to have, see an arts walk or a movie night. Um, maybe do uh, historical facts around town because as someone pointed out, if you didn't grow up in Reading, then you, you, did, you missed all of the town uh, history. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, another grocery store downtown a la um, the Atlantic, which everyone loves and I know misses. Um, some, some, some sort of a strategy for, let's see. Um, Oh, more awareness around the, let's see, the, the, oh, a leasing plan perhaps, like a visual aid and some marketing data that could help bring businesses into our community and, and locate the, um, the 
empty storefronts that are available to them. I kind of went all over the board here. Oh, and the things that we would love to see are more benches, bike racks, and street art. Oh, we thought, we did think that perhaps uh, if the economic development director in town were in charge of the downtown area with the help of an economic development group made up of business and residents. I think that's it. All right, so let's go to table three. Did you guys appoint a spokesperson? Um, um, so um, on question number one, um, we actually did, um, we, we considered um, the 40R and what the town should be planning for next in the downtown area, and we um, felt pretty strongly that with so much inventory coming online, online all at the same time with other communities as well, um, that um, it would be um, wise for um, us to digest what we have. Um, we were concerned about the entrance um, to Reading. Um, and um, seeing what we could do up at that point because the view when you're coming in um, from Stoneham is not um, the most pleasant view and entrance to the city if you're trying to brand and invite. Um, so something should be done up, up in that area as well. Um, as far as our top three priorities from public infrastructure, um, we um, strongly support the Uber pickup sites. I um, think it could be used for commuters as well. Um, there are seven Ubers that are sitting around right now just waiting for somebody if anybody needs a ride home tonight. Um, so um, we also um, um, suggested coordination of the traffic signal management based on the day of the week and also the time of the day. Um, and um, um, we also highlighted sidewalks. I know you said only three, but um, the other point was homogenizing the downtown um, overall have an inviting look and feel. Um, and that could be part of the branding and, and where you go with that. Um, as far as the question about mall man, um, managers, um, we actually felt that there are a lot of stakeholders involved. It's not just a small business community. All of a sudden, you're going to have a lot more residents in the area. Um, there are existing homeowners um, that are affected, and there's the business community. And there's also all the churches and nonprofits. So uh, making sure that um, whatever group you pull together, that you get the voice of all of the individuals that are, that are affected by the work that's going on in downtown. Um, and um, we were all over the place as far as how the downtown should be promoted and marketed and what type of events. Um, I think the well, one, um, one thought was uh, marketing through the MBTA. We also um, are, are proud of the, the charity and the cultural work that actually is happening in, the, um, in town and in, um, if there's a way that we can promote that. Um, and um, there was a suggestion for an art and cultural tour as well. Thank you, Julie. All right. Table to spokesperson. All right, David. All right. Um, one of our number one for the priority was improving traffic patterns downstairs, down in the downtown. Um, we also thought that it might be worthwhile looking at the lines where the zoning district for business is because a lot of um, sites aren't that developable for anything decent because the narrowness of the thing along main, the zoning district along Main Street. Um, our top priorities, um, one request is if we do more benches, put backs on them so you can rest on them. Um, we'd like to see something with some wider sidewalks integrated into new development, which would give more outside eating opportunities and less hassles on creating that. Uh, we also talked about electric vehicle charging stations integrated into the downtown. Um, we think as far as number three with mall manager or something like that, we think it would just be good to strengthen the Chamber of Commerce because it already does a lot there and just having more support for that would be more effective because it reaches a wider range of businesses than just retailers. Um, for events downtown, um, we all think that the street fair has been very popular and successful and a good event. Looking at maybe some more events on the common on different weekends. Um, which I know has been happening more, and then maybe something like an expanded uh, shop the block that would be something like a holiday stroll or a long weekend event versus just a one night thing, and uh, adding a beer garden back to the street fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess uh, as far as other suggestions, I think it was a consensus at this table that the split tax rate was a very bad idea by the Board of Selectmen last night. Um, and um, 
we'd like to keep the senior center where it is because I know there's been talk about looking at where it should be and what it should be. That's about it. Thank you very much, table two. Okay, and last but not least, table one. Do you have a spokesperson? Oh, Mary Ellen. Wonderful. Uh, table number one, we have a nice mix of residents and um, downtown business owners who I think some live in town also. Uh, number one, some of the things that we'd like to see is flexibility in the parking limits, some increased and some decreased, depending on the businesses that those spaces are near. Um, perhaps some green spaces, and pocket parks. <clears throat> uh, implement, actually implement the wayfinding signage. Uh, we definitely support the pickup and drop off areas for Uber, Lyft, and other uh, services. And there was a suggestion for reflective painting on the wayfinding signs so they'd be visible at night. Uh, number two, that we couldn't really pick on three priorities. We had lots of great suggestions, of course. Um, one was to remove the brick and cobblestones downtown for safer walking and for better accessibility for uh, disabled or other people that need those. Um, safer walking surfaces. Uh, a directory of uh, businesses at Haven and Main for people walking or uh, around downtown to be able to find the different uh, businesses. Uh, selective use of banners would be good. Uh, better trash uh, receptacles, bigger, better, more useful, more recycling options. Uh, definitely more bike racks, especially at the depot. Some hanging plants, however that would be funded and better maintenance of sidewalks, weeds, and trees downtown for um, a nicer appearance. In terms of the downtown organization, we had a couple of different ideas. One would be a staff person at downtown, at town hall rather, who would um, be a liaison with the businesses, CPDC and the select board. And uh, there were some comments that the select board is encouraged to talk more with business owners. There's also a suggestion for perhaps geographically based groups, um, the downtown being one, the Jordans area, and then the market basket, stop and shop areas, a couple of examples. We didn't get into, unfortunately, number four about marketing downtown. In terms of other suggestions, um, I wrote a few here that were from me, but we didn't get to talk about that either. Oh, let's hear them? Oh, thank you. <laughs> One we talked a little bit about was what to do with the other side of Main Street. I think that's a huge challenge. Um, the businesses on the uh, northeast side of Main Street. Um, I personally would like to see more condos, less apartments. As one retailer that I know downtown said in his business, people who are owning apartments aren't going to be coming buying what he has to sell. So people that are more invested maybe may be the ones that own the condos. Um, and then following up on a uh, comment from another group, um, the only way to get the downtown residents that will be coming down to use their cars less is to have some type of um, grocery store available to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Well, that wraps up our night. I just once again want to say thank you to everyone for taking the time to come tonight. We heard a lot of really great ideas. Um, we will have all the information on the website, as we mentioned. The link is at the bottom of your um, agenda. Um, if anyone didn't get a copy of the downtown business map, uh, there's a couple left here, so feel free to grab it. And I know some of you thought um, having them available at the businesses would be helpful. So um, I'll work with Leslie Leahy uh, on uh, maybe a way that we can make that happen and um, figure something out. Especially with the busy holiday season, we want to be um, proactive and responsive to um, keeping all those holiday shops. Um, and as always, if people think of after the meeting, feel free to send us an email, Julie, myself, Andrew. And I just once again want to thank everybody for coming, especially our awesome team. Uh, if you could join me with a hand of applause to all the great work that they did. Um, thank you so much. And everybody, drive home careful. Careful. Safe and careful,